Hello, John. How are you? I'm doing great. Good to see you, Glenn. Very good to see you. This is indeed Glenn Lowry uh, here at the Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv. Uh, and I'm talking today with John David Scritney, who's professor of sociology at the University of California, San Diego, and is the director of the Yankelevich Center for Social Science Research at uh, UCSD. Um, and is also the author of a number of important books on uh, race, uh, affirmative action, uh, and uh, uh, equal employment opportunity laws uh, and how they play out, how they came to be um, initially uh, conceived and implemented, uh, what role they play in contemporary American society and so forth. Um, I won't list these books, but uh, let me just say the ironies of affirmative action is one of them. And... Um, the Minority Rights Revolution is another, and they're both foundational texts for people studying these issues. And John's most recent book is called After Civil Rights. I'll obviously let you let him tell you about it. But um, there, we just happen to have a copy in hand. Uh, <laughs> After Civil Rights, Princeton University <laughs> Press, 2014, uh, in which John explores at great, uh, uh, in great depth and uh, with a comprehensive uh, scope uh, the new role... <clears throat> As he understands it, and again, he can tell you about this, that race is playing in contemporary American uh, economic uh, and labor relations and employment world. And it's a role that is complicated in, in ways that he ex, uh, exposits in the book and that in some sense is in tension with uh, the classical civil rights uh, uh, equal employment opportunity framework because it is a world in which employers are taking seriously or uh, taking seriously the importance of the racial identities of their employees for the effectiveness of their businesses, their customer relations, their bottom line. Uh, and a, a subtle dynamic goes on there that he exposits in the book, that he describes in the book. Anyway, I talked too long. The reason I've asked John to come on the Glenn Show today, we are the Tuesday after the Sunday after the Friday. Today is Tuesday. On Sunday, the NFL had football games as they do every Sunday in the fall, and uh, the players uh, reacted to what happened on Friday when President uh, Trump uh, made the remarks that he did make in Alabama, uh, calling sons of bitches the football players who would take a knee during the playing of the national anthem, and inviting owners to contemplate the prospect of firing these SOBs for disrespecting our flag. Everybody out there in Blocking Hits land knows about this. It's created a firestorm. I wanted to get John's view, both of the controversy and of what it reveals more deeply about this particular industry, an important industry in American public life. I'm talking about uh, professional sports. I'm talking about, and I'll stop, arenas that taxpayers have to fork over hundreds of millions of dollars to get them built. I'm talking about antitrust policies that the federal government formulates that it formulates that influences the things that are going on there. I'm talking about the racial composition of players vis-a-vis -vis the racial composition of fans and the delicate marketing challenge that that poses for advertisers and for team owners as they try to manage their businesses with an eye toward their profit. So, uh, John, welcome to The Glenn Show. And uh, I've talked long enough. Uh, why don't you give us at least a preview of uh, what you're thinking now uh, on these uh, important questions? Well, I think, I think, Glenn, you did a great job laying out the most important issues. But the thing I would really emphasize, the story that I would want us to keep at the forefront as we think about these things, is that, as you said, you called it an industry. Professional sports is a business. And a big part of the book is to, do, is to show as comprehensively as possible the way market forces are shaping the way we think about race in the United States, and particularly in the context of employment. You know, we've, market forces have always been a part of the story of race, but for most of the nation's history, it was about, it was, the only game in town was, was white, was whiteness. You know, you, you made sure that you hired white, you put white people on TV, you put white people on the playing field, because the only consumer who mattered were, were white people. And what, what has changed is, is America has become more diverse. And employers have noticed this. And they have, they have realized in, in many contexts, it's good business to think about race. And this is a big change in the way, from the way we used to think about race in terms of non-whites in America. For the longest time, and the law kind of dictated this approach, we thought about not paying attention to race at all. And if we did pay attention to it, we did it with a backward, backwards-looking uh, approach. 
That is, the law of affirmative action said, <coughs> uh, it said employers could use affirmative action if they want to, but they have to be repairing some kind of racial imbalance. So the goal was about justice and it was about repairing something that had happened in the past and all across America, the thing that needed to be repaired was discrimination, especially against African Americans, but Latinos and Asian Americans as well. What's happened really since, you know, maybe we could trace it to the early 70s, but it really got going in the 1980s as America became more diverse, um, as some states such as my own in California here become majority minority, is employers began to think, hey, you know, we've got significant African American client bases, we've got significant, especially Latino client bases. Latino is now about 17% of the population. Asian Americans are the fastest growing group in the United States. And employers began to think, well, you know, these are important constituencies. And, and there was a couple different ways that they could go about um, trying to appeal to these folks. One way is um, something that I call racial signaling. It's a term that is popular in economics. Sociologists have used it as well. Um, the way they used it in economics was that was that um, people applying for a job would want to signal their, their, their worthiness for the job or their aptitude for the job by showing off their educational credentials. Those were signals. They didn't necessarily mean that the person had a particular aptitude. Yeah. I'm kind of reversing that a little bit, and I'm thinking about how um, an employee's race might signal something to others, to potential customers, to audiences, right? So it's a little bit, you know, a little bit uh, change in the direction, but the idea is still the same. It's manipulating something about yourself and making it part of a job qualification. And, um, and you know, we, I think the story that we hear the most about in the United States is the idea of, of hiring in, in diverse ways to generate more ideas and more creativity. That's a more general and very benign approach because it doesn't slot people into particular racialized scripts or roles. But a lot of places will hire someone because of their race so they can send a signal either to persons of the same race in the audience or to everyone to show that this place isn't some lily white backwater from the 1950s. So the, the idea is that race is being strategically used in ways that in some cases can benefit non-whites um, in other ways, though, it can pigeonhole them and sort of make them into tokens. And I remember, Brent, uh, um, Glenn, when I presented on this at Brown, you were very nervous about that. You said, you know, you know, it's it's kind of locking people into stereotype thinking that the only one, the only, the only physician who can serve them is a fellow African American or a, a fellow Asian American or something. It's kind of freezing us into this sort of racialized thinking. Right. And uh, and, and, and do you remember that? Yeah, I do remember that. that. And uh, that informed, you know, as I wrote the conclusion of the book, you know, we can't, we have to avoid situations where people are locked into specific jobs. So, so that's something that I'm very concerned about. Now, to bring the topic to the issue of sports, yes. we're, definitely talking, we're definitely talking about a business here. And as I show in the book, race has always been a, been a part of the business of sports. For the longest time, it was signaling whiteness. You know, there was a time in the 80s where the city of Boston really stood out signalizing white signal signaling whiteness to fellow white bostonians with the boston red sox which for about four years had only one african-american on the team jim rice who happened to be the mvp of the whole league the whole american <laughs> league and he was the only african-american on the team for a while and then and then i think you know the boston celtics of larry bird kevin McHale, danny ainge um uh they had an african-american coach at the time uh, but but they were a majority white team, and there was a few years where they only had four African American players. Most team had a, most teams had at least seven. So they've been they've been you know race has been a part of the story. The Washington Redskins famously <clears throat> refused to draft a, uh, a, a a black player, even though other teams had been doing it since the 1940s. They resisted, and and the the owner <clears throat> the owner of the team, George Marshall, he said, you know I'm like you know I'm putting on a show. For the audience, and the audience, I think, wants to see white people. So, so this idea of using race has benefited whites for a long time, and now I think that um, you know race has become part of the story. Um, you know, as Latinos have become a growing part of the population, um, you know, the New York Mets uh, sought out a, a pitcher, Pedro Martinez, to appeal to Dominican populations. Um, when they brought the Washington Nationals to Washington D.C., a majority black city. Um, the, the major league, major league baseball was quite concerned about being able to appeal to African-American audiences there. So they, they insisted on having a African-American manager to kind of get some buy-in from the community. 
So race has been woven into sports. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Let me, let me just stop you. MLB insisted that the owners of the Nationals employ an African-American uh, manager? I wouldn't say they insisted, yeah. but they thought it would be a good idea. They thought it would be a good idea. They strongly encouraged that. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, um, African-Americans were at that time only about 10% <coughs> of Major League Baseball. Now that's down to 7%. So, you know, African-Americans are about 13% of the national population. So African-Americans are once again underrepresented in Major League Baseball. You know, Latinos have risen in, in their importance, Asian players as well. Um, but this is a concern in, in sports leagues. They want to appeal, not all of them, of course, um, but sports sports leagues want to appeal to a wide audience because it's it's a business. Now, what's really interesting here, and I, I, I love the point you made about the stadiums, is that professional sports is definitely a business. It's about making profits, but it has this civic kind of attachment to it. Yeah. You know, there's there there these teams are named after cities. They become part. They become woven into the culture and the fabric of the yeah. cities. Um, you know, I grew up near Chicago, a, a city that was starved for winners for the longest time. You did too, as, as I recall. I did. I grew up on the south side yeah. of Chicago. South, oh, yeah. Okay. So, White Sox um, and the Cubs and the Bears and the Bulls and so, and the Blackhawks. Yeah. Let me not forget that. Even though I've never <laughs> attended a hockey game, <laughs> I guess the well, audience for hockey games is not a representative sampling of the uh, hockey matches. What do you call? It? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, go on. You, 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 you. Yeah. So I w I was born in '66, and we there was through my whole life there was never a winner in Chicago until the Bears came in 1985. Yeah. And uh, and I remember they put Bears helmets on the Lions in front of the Art Institute of Chicago. <laughs> I mean yeah. it, that was. You know, it was a civic thing. They have parades. All cities do this. They have parades down the street. Sure. They have big rallies. So, and then, as you pointed out, taxpayers fund help fund the stadiums. Over the past several years, yeah. about half of the $12 billion or so, when my book came out, the best statistics I had was $12 billion had been spent on stadiums. About $7 billion came from taxpayers. So these are businesses that are culturally woven into the civic spirit of the, of, of the cities, sometimes the states, if we're talking about the Carolina Panthers or something, um, and, and, and they actually receive funds. And so, you know, there's an interesting dynamic here that if race becomes part of that, you know, we need to be careful about how race is being portrayed and how race is being understood um, in these contexts. And it's uh, a tricky, it's a tricky area, and uh, I'm I'm happy that we can maybe we can make some make some hay on it here. Well, I don't know what we'll accomplish here, but let's give it a shot. Uh, now, and I want to talk more about the NFL and about what's been going on most recently. Um, but I, first, I want to underscore this point about almost civic religion or civic sacredness. I, you go to a mm -hmm. baseball game at Fenway Park, okay? Obviously, there's some ritualistic enactment about who we. You know, Boston tough after the marathon bombing. Boston, uh, uh, Big Poppy, uh, 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 what's the guy's name? You know, uh, the, the, the power hitter uh, uh, Ortiz, David Ortiz. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, after the uh, marathon bombing, uh, he made some uh, profane uh, declaration that added up to, you better not mess with us, we are Bostonians and we're mm -hmm. tough. And you should have seen the people, mostly white, mostly Irish Catholics, uh, you mm -hmm. know, South Boston residents, not entirely, but, you know, bowing down to Big Poppy, this big black uh, uh, guy from, uh, uh, where's he from, Cuba or uh, Dominican Republic, He's, you know, yep. uh, uh, because he was their priest. He, he, was, the, he was their civic yeah. priest. So this right. is this is the uh, deep deeper meanings that are being conveyed by uh, what it is that these athletes and sports franchises do. All the more uh, reason why this uh, flag issue, because we got these two kind of symbolic engines going. We got kids with posters of Steph Curry on the wall of their bedrooms. Yeah. They want to be him when they grow up because have you seen that guy play basketball? He's absolutely amazing. On yeah. the other hand, uh, a whole lot of people are saluting the flag and uh, <laughs> genuflecting at the various uh, civic rituals that we associate with patriotism. Um, and, and so it's like a flashpoint, a real flashpoint within the political culture. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to underscore that. The stakes yeah. are enormously high. Yeah, and I think, I think there's a, there's a the nationalism, is, nationalism is tied into it, a civic spirit is tied into it. And I often, I often think, you know, Karl Marx famously said, religion is the opiate of the masses. 
If you go to any major city with a major sports team, sports is the opiate of the masses. No matter how miserable your job is, you are uplifted by the victory of your team. And, and you see it all over the place. Here in San Diego, we lost the Chargers. You know, there's, I see people with, with the lightning bolt tattoo, and you know, there, it's a wound <laughs> now. It's like, it's, you yeah. know, it's a symbol of their pain. So all these things are, are, tied, are tied together. And, um, and you know, I was thinking about how odd it is that we, that we play the national anthem before a corporate event, before a, a celebration of two owners pitting their wares against each other in a, in a capitalistic, you know, frenzy, which, you know, the selling of the merchandise and all this sort of stuff. And we say the national anthem against teams when, when teams are playing against each other, these are American teams, you know, people make the distinction about the national anthem at the Olympics, you know, yeah. they were competing against the world and, you know, the flag and it makes sense. You're, you're representing the nation here. We're representing cities. Why the national anthem is woven into this is is kind of an odd thing. I was actually thinking it might make more sense, and I'm just being playful here, but it might make more sense for us to play the national anthem when Apple releases a new iPhone because we're <laughs> competing, against, competing against Samsung, well, or when Ford has a new car out because we're competing against Toyota and, and so many other makers. You know, But you've got it's, tens it's, of it's thousands awesome. of people all gathered in the same place. It, it becomes mm -hmm. the occasion for the enactment of ritual. Uh -huh. uh, and you've got a country that's been perpetually at war. I wonder if it would be quite the same thing if we hadn't been perpetually at war for the last, uh, gosh, 15 years or whatever. Uh, and that uh, I, I understand. I actually don't know this for a fact, but I've been told that the Defense Department had actually been paying uh, sports teams, maybe football teams, to uh, enact patriotic uh, activities during halftime celebrations, that they put up some money to help their, you know, I don't know, cover costs associated with, and, right. and I don't know what, I should know more about this before I speak to it. But um, I understand why the national anthem might be played on that occasion, because if you're mm. a propagandist, uh, you've got a captive audience. Right, right. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, I've been reading about this, and, and people are pointing out there's other times people gather where the anthem wasn't, isn't, isn't played. Yeah. The anthem. The anthem, I looked into the history of this, the anthem didn't get played regularly at sport, professional sports events until World War II. Um, you know, the, the, the Star Spangled Banner wasn't even our national anthem until 1931. I know, that's it, an amazing fact, isn't it? It's incredible. I, it is incredible. And, and these, but these, these meanings are so deep and so yeah. strong, and the, the passions are so intense. And, um, and you know... Yeah, I, I've been I've been reading all this stuff. People are pointing out all these ways that the flag it's put on clothes, and it's you know there's there's all these rules about how the flag should be treated, and those are violated all the time, and people are not upset about those things. But there's something about an African American player doing even a, a very benign gesture of kneeling. He's not turning around. He's not. You know, I mean, kneeling, as as many commentators have pointed out, is a way to show respect and. And certainly the Catholic faith, you know, you genuflect. And, um, and so it's a very benign way to say. But, but Colin Kaepernick told us why he was kneeling. And I think therein lies the rub. I mean, if he had just knelt mm -hmm. and uh, left it uh, am ambiguous, you know, I mean, I'm kneeling. I prefer to kneel and not say anything further. But he went on to say he didn't want to respect the flag or words that effect of a country that was oppressing people of color and uh, letting police right. officers get away with murder. And uh, people then took that uh, as a disrespectful uh, reflection of the, I mean, the flag is the symbol of the country and so on. It is fair to say that people have fought and died for the rights of professional athletes to apply their trade uh, mm -hmm. under that flag. And um, I, I'm just giving you the other side of this argument, and I'm not trying yeah, to be yeah. tendentious here. Um, I remember during the 2008 campaign, uh, President Obama for a minute there was objecting to wearing a lapel pin with an American yeah. flag on his suit. He didn't want to wear it. Right. And it was, you know, and Sean Hannity or whomever was going ballistic about the fact that candidate Obama would not wear this lapel pin. And David Axelrod on this telling of the story, maybe mm -hmm. apocryphal, says to candidate Obama, put the friggin' lapel pin in, will you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because this is not a fight we really want or need. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, yeah. I, I take your point. 
that it's an empty symbolic gesture, et cetera, et cetera. Please mm-hmm. don't be so high minded <laughs> as to ruin your electoral prospects by mm-hmm. not putting that lapel pin in. And I'm just wondering what you think about um, – because I've been reading these pieces now about the NFL where everybody, not everybody, but a number of observer, observers are saying um, no good will come of this for the business. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, uh, I don't know, 15 percent, 20 percent of your customers like Donald Trump and like that flag. Right. And don't much care for Black Lives Matter and don't think the cops are uh, murderers. Right. Right. Now, you can't take a 15 or 20 percent hit in your uh, revenues at the gate, in your TV audience size, in your advertising dollars, you don't want your advertisers to have to decide whether their brands are going to be endangered with 15% of their... Yeah. Now you're into a calculation about how many more progressive peak customers do I gain and how many more conservative customers do I lose? And this is exactly the position that you did not want to be in. Right. And I just wonder yeah. what you think about that. Well, I think it really highlights the, the the issues we were talking about about how professional sports are this weird hybrid of of civic and 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 business, and it's and it's really forcing the owners to have to decide. You know, it's putting them. It's really putting them on the spot. And I'm sure a lot of them are wishing. I wish we never played the national anthem of these events in the first place, because for Jerry Jones, did you see the pictures of him out there with the Cowboys? No, I didn't see them. Oh, that's it's powerful. He's the owner of the Cowboys. He's out there. Yeah, he's on. He's on his knee with the Cowboy players in Texas, of all places. You know, they're in the in the South, and the and I didn't see the game, but the accounts say the booze rained down upon them. Wow. He's there. He's having to make. He's having. Yeah. He's having to weave politics into his business in ways that he didn't want to do. I mean, they've been able to benefit from football being as American as apple pie for so long, and being right up there with the flag and. You know, having the jets fly over the stadium at the Super Bowl, and you know, they benefited from the from the tight uh, association of pro sports with yeah. patriotism and nationalism and civic spirit for so long. And now it's making them, it's forcing them to have to make these choices. And it's it's fascinating for us to have these conversations. I don't, you know, there, there's so much in culture, Glenn. I believe that is incoherent, but it we but it makes sense to us. And, you know, when foreigners come and they say, why do you guys do this? Why do you do that? We, we, yeah. we, can't, really, we can't really explain it. And this is forcing us to come to terms with some stuff that sort of came together in this piecemeal fashion over time. Um, you know, World War, it, it wasn't an accident that we started doing the national anthem during World War II. It's because this, you know, global conflict and, you know, American democracy was very much at stake. If you look at the news media of that time, yeah. there was a real question of whether fascism was a superior system to democracy. And um, so that was a special time. And then it's hard to go back from that. It's hard to, you know, ratchets up and not downward. And, um, and, and the issue is just forcing, it's forcing these owners who benefited from that tight linkage of patriotism and, 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 and their business model to, to make some choices. And it'll be interesting to see where it, where it comes out. I, I, my guess is that they're hoping that there'll be a new distraction and the media will move on to something else and people like you and I will stop talking about it and we'll, you know, there'll be a new issue. That guy right in North now, Korea might see to it, John. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. uh, gee, that's a, that's a subject for another, uh, <laughs> for another conversation. Um, but, but, but the larger story here, you know, is, is this, is this market story here and, and, you know, one of the things civil rights laws did was they, they tried to put principle in the place of market. It, 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 it immediately became illegal for white business owners to cater to discriminatory customers in, you know, in, in, re, in a retail, for example. Right. Uh, you know. Right. I get Wool- it. Yeah. The lunch counters at Woolworths are all these right. places that were, you know, such flashpoints. They, they you couldn't know, say to a, to a black person that they would not serve, sorry, I'd love to serve you, but you know, it's really, really terrible for my business. Right, exactly. Yeah. And so, so all these businesses began to hire without regard to race. And if they didn't, they were subject to lawsuits, except for the media and entertainment. Somehow they were given a pass. You know, it was just, it, it made people very, very uncomfortable to put um, civil rights laws into this area. And I went and I looked at the congressional debates on this and, and the Southerners who wanted, who were very, you know, you know, they were doing everything they could to stop the civil rights laws from marching through Congress. 
And, um, and one of the things that the Southerners said was, well, what about the Harlem Globetrotters? They're going to have to hire white people. And, and the members of Congress said, no, no, no. They kind of dismissed that out of hand. But it was an issue that hadn't been resolved. And, you know, um, it, it really only took um, – and the only court case I've been able to find on the use of race, which is rampant in casting – they use race yeah. all the time. I was just about it's, to ask about that. Are yeah. there any uh, civil rights cases that have been brought against yeah. producers at so, Warner Brothers or somewhere? For yeah, so yes. so the so it became illegal immediately to say in your help wanted ad, you know, I want a white person for this job, or or, or I want a black person for that job. That yeah. became illegal. You could not do that, except in casting where they would say, you know, we, they would say European American or a blonde is wanted or some yeah. space, you know, some, you know, they might want African Americans for, that was all over. They call it, they call them um, breakdowns where the casting has decided who's going to fit to all these different roles. And it was just there as plain as day. And, you know, there's, there's books about Hollywood where they reproduce these. I, I reproduce many in my book and you can see exactly how they did it. And it was never challenged until, and I think this is interesting, it was a reality show, The Bachelor, where they had always had white bachelors, and then they were doing a casting uh, for, and you know, again, it's a reality show, it's not even a fictitious you know, story, yeah. and, they, um, and two African-American guys came, and they, they applied, and they were told basically to go home that you know, there was no interest in them. And the producers of the show had said that they didn't think white America was ready for an African-American bachelor. And those guys sued, and they lost. And they, they lost! They lost. Um, and basically, what the, uh, it was a district court. You know, I, I looked, I was curious. It was a Bill Clinton appointee. Yeah. But, um, but they lost, and basically what the judge said was, this is kind of like the, uh, the St. Patrick's Day parade in Boston. Remember when, when gay people wanted to march in the parade? Um, and the, the Supreme Court said this is like this is expression and decide, you know, the, the, the parade itself is a kind of speech act. And so you can't limit that or force particular kinds of content on the organizers of a parade. I and that's see. basically what the judge said here, that you can't use civil rights laws to force content on on the casting director for a television show. You know, um, the, it was a freedom of speech issue. And um, I haven't seen an appeal to that case. I, I think you know we should have a national debate about it because it kind of gets at some of the challenges of a diverse society. And I'll tell you, Glenn, just one other point on this. You know, if market forces are going to be shaping the way we think about things, that means the United States, with its long and terrible history of slavery and the extermination of Native American peoples, we're going to be looking more and more like other countries that are dealing with immigration. And I think that um, the Europeans are going to be dealing with this issue increasingly diverse populations. I think that, you know, any country that's receiving immigrants becoming more diverse is going to start thinking in terms of these market logics, government services, policing, teaching, who's the best teacher for particular students of particular backgrounds. These are, these are issues that we're going to have to confront in diverse societies. And we're going to have to weigh the evidence, which sometimes shows that teachers perform better with, uh, or students perform better with a teacher of their same race, some evidence shows that um, that police officers uh, are less likely to be violent with if they're policing neighborhoods of the same race, African American. The evidence is typically mixed, but these are issues that we're going to have to be grappling with. And then back to your point, which is, if if we honor these kinds of patterns, are we freezing into place a kind of stereotypical thinking that we should be trying to move beyond? Yeah. Um, what about the legitimacy argument? Public institutions need to have a diverse uh, uh, personnel uh, in order to uh, cultivate the sense of you know confidence that people have. And so juries, yeah, okay, the jury renders a guilty or not guilty verdict in the case of a police officer who's accused of uh, criminally assaulting or killing a black citizen. And now we're looking at the jury, Philando Castile. That was the case in uh, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And the jury acquitted that guy. And the first thing I wanted to know was, were there any blacks on the jury? Because I knew that that was going to color the uh, public reception of the uh, result. There were two blacks who served on that jury and who ultimately acquitted. Um, there was an 11 to 1 uh, deadlock for a while. And they went back and ended up with a unanimous not guilty on that police officer. So those two African-American jurors eventually did vote for acquittal. 
but uh, we all know that if there had been no African Americans on that jury, as there were none, as I recall, on the Simi Valley jury that acquitted mm-hmm. the police officers in the case that led to the rioting in Los Angeles in 1992, mm-hmm. then uh, the uh, legitimacy of that verdict would have been significantly, um, significantly reduced. Yeah. Um, we ask uh, about uh, presidential cabinets all the time, whether or not they are diverse. Mm-hmm. And I assume somehow uh, the public reception of the authority of the government is conditioned to some degree on whether or not the uh, leadership of the government is uh, demographically representative. So on. What do you think is going to happen in the NFL case? Who's going to win? Well, I think that, um, I mean, to, to address some of the points you just made, yep. again, going back to something you said a little bit earlier, you, you made a very important point when you talked about Colin Kaepernick by kneeling during the national anthem. He was doing it as a political statement. And what you were really saying was that his motive mattered. Yep. And that, that's a basic principle in American law. All kinds of actions have different kinds of consequences depending on the motive of the actor. And when it comes to racial outcomes in juries and in presidential cabinets and in the workforce of you know, Walmart or any place or a sports team, um, you know, the, the, the motive matters. And so what we want to do or what the law says that we should be doing is eliminating discrimination and repairing past discrimination but the law does gives very, very little room for folks to have a, a forward-looking motive and, and, and a motive based on a stereotype, right? So when you talked about those juries coming out in different ways, we were kind of, you know, and I was nodding as well, we're kind of stereotyping white and black juries, aren't we? Sure. But yeah. they're typical, you know, and we're generalizing about them. And, and the law is clear that we, we're not supposed to do that. So we can put procedures in place that'll ensure that juries will be, um, that will be diverse, that will reflect uh, a true jury of, of the defendant's peers, right? Um, but, we, but we can't do, um, uh, we can't have the jury selection process, um, which is voir dire, um, we, we can't have a process that's based on stereotypes. So that's where it gets tricky. And, um, and, and the law is very clear on, on trying to move us away from stereotypes. Yeah, this point about stereotyping is interesting to me uh, because I'm thinking now about the prototypical statement that you hear people making is that uh, I felt very comfortable because I saw some people who looked like me or I didn't feel comfortable because there was no one there at the party, in the faculty meeting, uh, at the workplace, uh, in the queue waiting to get into the party who looked like me. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't really know very much about a person from seeing how they look, but you can project onto that person your conception of how they might behave of what they might believe or value based Mm -hmm. upon how they look. And when you do that, you're doing cognitively the same kind of mental act that a police officer is doing when he sees a young African-American man and he presumes that that person is dangerous. You're projecting something onto that person. Right. Um, And, you know, it's first of all, it's unavoidable in social life that that kind of thing is going to happen because people have to make inferences with limited information. (laughs) Mm-hmm. But it, it does behoove us, I think, to be reflective and, and maybe even a little bit cautious about uh, about building too much of institutional design or sort of public policy on a foundation that is uh, is uh, 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 relying heavily upon presumptions that if I see the race <laughs> of a person, I know something about their character about their mm-hmm. politics, about the, I mean, I only know a statistical association, which is what stereotyping is. Mm-hmm. Um, um, anyway, you following the, um, anything else you want to say about uh, the, the racial, uh, is, is uh, the, uh, are professional sports a meritocracy? I mean, in the old days, teams had to worry, I don't want to have blacks because it'll piss off the fans, or I need to have more whites because I'm going to, I'm branding myself as the great white hope team here in the uh, NBA or whatever the Boston Celtics thought they were doing in the 1970s. Um, uh, but uh, does, isn't that kind of a thing of the past? That's a question. Uh, isn't this now an arena in which basically pure talent is determining who gets selected to play the game? That's a question. Yeah. And uh, the overrepresentation numerically of African Americans in these leagues. Isn't that something that African Americans can take pride in? Because these are uh, are, uh, remunerative professional activities which we 
that is African Americans are uh, noticeably um, uh, excelling at. Right. Well, I think that, um, and, and and I think you know your work. You've, you you'll have a lot of insights in this. One of the conservative critiques of affirmative action um, has long been the notion that everyone has equal desires to to pursue the same kinds of occupations. The notion that everyone, that every racial group or ethnic group or religious group, or men and women both have equal desires to be uh, professional athletes, to play football over professional hockey, to, you know, to go into um, hedge funds, to be a trader in finance, to be an attorney, to go into electrical engineering versus civil engineering, to be a social worker versus a police officer. Yeah. You know, people have different desires. They learn from each other. Sometimes they follow racial role models. Like, you know, you were, you were suggesting a, a moment ago, people notice these things. Hey, there's someone like me who does that. I, that's something else that I can do. And, um, and then there's, there's, you know, we live in a class society as well. And so there's different kinds of supports for people to pursue different kinds of, uh, different kinds of excellence in, in different sports. So we didn't see a Tiger Woods until, you know, we had this unique situation of, you know, this guy growing up in Southern California. His mom is from Thailand. His father really wanted to pursue this. That wasn't a normal thing that African Americans did. African Americans normally were forbidden from being members of golf clubs. Yeah. You know, there's there's issues, you know, there's issues here. We, <clears throat> we now have multiple African American women's tennis champions. Um, yeah. and there'll probably be more. Yeah. <clears throat> Koreans are putting a lot of effort into women's golf. There's, there's, it's kind of like Kenyans and marathons now, you know, so there's, you know, when you say, is there a meritocracy, there's, there's a lot of inequality in terms of interest, in terms of infrastructural support, you know, we're never going to, you know, it, it's, it's hard to say that we're going to have a pure meritocracy because society is so diverse. People are responding to different things, different kinds of opportunities and different kinds of inf infrastructural supports. You know, my buddy Paul Freimer, who you know, we, we, we always marvel at the number of the white players in the NBA who are from Europe. Yeah, yeah. You know, and they're from Eastern Europe. We got Porzingis from, from Latvia. With, yeah. There's a long string of players from Croatia and yeah. Serbia. You know. That's because you know they have the infrastructure there to encourage from a young age. Um, I don't know if you saw uh, Porzingis with dreadlocks, or he had like braids in his hair. No, I didn't see little. that, but that's he so was, funny, was, man. <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> he was in Latvia, and he's he's idolizing American. Now, now uh, unless I'm mistaken, Scrutiny is an Eastern European name, isn't it? It is. It is. Uh, I, I, have, I have a bit of pride in that, but unfortunately, <laughs> uh, Hungary and Poland have contributed very little to the NBA. Yeah. Um, in fact, the only Hungarian player got dunked on by Tracy McGrady in 1999 in a scene that Ooh. it's still on YouTube. It's still on YouTube. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, we, uh, we hold our own in water polo. So um, look, look out for that. Well, look, oh. um, meritocracy oh. is not necessarily the same thing as statistical mirroring. That's the, that's the word that I'm used to hearing people say. Mm -hmm. uh, th that is... Meritocracy doesn't have to imply that I'm going to have a demographic representation mirroring the population in every line of work, because as you say, people or groups have different orientations, interests, preferences, and so on. Um, I always thought that the statistical mirroring argument, which is we look across various arenas and we should see mirrored there the presence of groups uh, in reflection of their presence in the population, was was deeply problematic as a normative principle because it seemed to imply that there was nothing constitutive about being in one group or another. All, if I think everybody is supposed to be doing every different activity of human um, um, economic enterprise and culture to the same extent, just yeah. as frequently in academics, just as frequently in uh, entrepreneurship <laughs> and uh, starting up businesses, just as frequently in the arts, and so forth. And if I don't see the same numbers everywhere, I think there's something wrong. Then, in effect, I'm saying there really isn't any content to being a member of one group or another that has any consequence for how people live their lives. Right. But right. groups, if we're going to take them seriously as being distinct from one another in ways that are um, uh, that warrant uh, a person feeling a connection, a pride, or a tradition, mm -hmm. or uh, uh, a cultural affinity. 
um, are are going to vary with respect to the emphasis that's put on this or that aspect of uh, of human activity, and that's mm-hmm. going to have results in uh, ultimately that are going to be reflected in the labor markets. I don't think the idea of statistical mirroring is coherent, is what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess um, I mean part of the point I wanted to make is that uh, you know we've been talking about sports, but there's this documentary about the National Spelling Bee. Have you seen this? I've heard it's, about it. I've heard a lot about it. And about the Indians? Yeah, the Indians do well, but it, it profiles several different um, young kids who are training for it. Okay, I have and, not and seen you, it. And you, you see the massive inequality in, in their ability to prepare. So there's a upper middle uh, class Indian American family that they can do all this tutoring and special, you know, special supports for that. And then there's a there's a poor Latina girl in South Texas whose parents don't even know that she's that she's preparing for it, wow. right? So 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 that kind of inequality is fascinating. And then the other issue when we're talking about, and I agree with everything you said about statistical mirroring, and that's not coherent. But there's an issue that that occurs here when we ask about well is this truly a meritocracy there's an issue that comes up and this goes right this is so glenn lowry you're you're going to fall out of your chair it's why do people want what they want and are people's is people's agency in some way shaped by discriminatory processes and the the, the, the way this has really been developed not so, it hasn't happened so much in race but more in gender so there was this case there was a famous case eeoc versus sears remember sears still struggling it's still there it used, <laughs> it used to be a, america's largest retailer right and in the in the 80s there was a problem because some of their people on the floor were paid a salary they got the same amount no matter what and then other workers were paid a commission and the commission workers were uh, ended up earning more and um, and the commission, the workers who, who were paid on a commission were overwhelmingly male, and the salaried workers were overwhelmingly female. And Sears, so the EOC sued, they noticed this inequality, and Sears said the women don't want to do the commission. You know, they, 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 being paid based on commission was something that they weren't comfortable with, that they were more risk averse in some way, that they were choosing to go into the salaried positions. And part of the critique of that was that it was a was a stereotype, and and b you know we we have to ask ourselves why would they think that what, you know yeah. what is steering them that and there you know the, that was the 1980s the big issue now is women in STEM, and whether whether women are being told that they yeah. are they don't have the aptitude to be electrical engineers and yeah. to be software developers and this sort of thing right so this subtle thing that you know and then they vote with their feet and they they major in other subjects and they choose other careers. Um, but the question is, why do they want what they want? Why do they make those choices? Is it because of something that, um, you know, some stereotypes that are beaten into their heads or something of that nature? So when you, so when you say, you know, is something a meritocracy, you know, we, we have to ask ourselves, well, if everyone had, you know, was equally encouraged, if everyone equally believed that they could succeed at this endeavor, would we see them there as well? And, and, and that is a, is just a difficult and thorny question. It's something at the heart of, of our fields in sociology and economics, why people want they, what they want. You know, that you're a, you're a pretty free-thinking economist. You're not going to just assume everyone's a utility maximizer. It, even if they are so, they're doing it within, within know, a, a, social, yeah, uh, a, a structural yeah. uh, context that uh, influences uh, the goals that they set for themselves as they try to maximize. No, I... I take that point, and and perhaps even more sharply, I would say, the ethics of it, if I have social oppression, let's say gender roles in the larger society, stereotypes about women, uh, unequal division of responsibilities for the maintenance of the home, and women having to take care of children, having to do uh, household chores, and, an un- and then uh, that influences the way in which they want to handle women their responsibilities at the workplace, perhaps a preference for the flexibility of time because they have home. Now, if I don't enforce in the workplace regulation uh, equal outcome for women, notwithstanding the differences in these behavioral manifestations, I'll be reifying and locking in the larger context of social oppression by catering to it, by by acquiescing in its implication rather than pushing back against it. So I, I see that that's a... Did you see this? Uh, you must have seen. Of course, you saw the controversy at Google and the, yeah. the employee, James Damore, whose uh, mm-hmm. memo became yep. uh, viral and so forth. What do you think about that? 
Well, that yeah, that was very that was a replay of the Sears case. It, it you know it really was, and yeah, and and you can you can find evidence that yes, you know, women might you know you know, they might choose certain majors over others and they might show some kind of preferences. But the question is, why is that the case? There's a sociologist at Stanford named Shelley Carell who did this, um, this interesting experimental work that showed how, you know, when, when people were told that men are better at a particular task um, or they're told that, you know, men and women are equally good at that task, they, they assess their own performance on an exam, even if it's randomly given to them, differently. And, you know, so these things have a way of kind of getting into our heads. And, um, and, and I think our conversation is kind of steering back toward the responsibility that businesses have. Yeah. You know, you know, are they, you know, I, we, I kind of, we kind of picked on the pro sports because the public helps build their stadiums and all this sort of stuff. But let's face it, the public helped Google develop their algorithm. NSF money supported the original research for that. Um, government yeah. money is all over these innovations. Yeah. And so we could make a similar argument that that you know not only should they be paying more taxes here, but you know we sh- we can make the argument that they owe something to us because the taxpayers help them become um, you know the rich uh, market dominant forces that they are today. Yeah, um, it's tough though because you know we have uh, the shareholder value you know and and the shareholders demand profits and you know they're not gonna they're not gonna want this kind of giving back on on their dime when they're holding the holding well, the share. It's a public good. I mean, changing the way I run my business in order to promote uh, social justice, but at the uh, expense of my bottom line, is asking me, in effect, to contribute to the production of a good that is a, like a public good, like national defense or whatever. And uh, my incentives to do that are going to be less than socially efficient. I, you know, I'm going to want the other guy to be the one that paid the price for doing that. Right. Um, Anything else, John, or uh, shall we uh, just call it a day until the next conversation that we have, which, which won't be <laughs> 10 years, I promise you. <laughs> well, and you mean until the next big controversy, which is going to roll. It's, we're not going to be able to guess what it'll be, but there's going to be something next week that we're all debating, I'm sure. I want to know why, maybe you can answer this for me. I want to know why um, or when Muslims are going to become a protected category uh, in terms of uh, ethnic slash racial minorities uh, to be protected by, I know anti-religious discrimination, but what about yeah. seeing them as an ethnic group and as a racial group? Well, that's, it's a great question. You know, in the eighties and the nineties, um, uh, some, some groups tried, um, Iranian Americans organized especially, um, and they tried to get, especially with the small business administration, yeah. you know, that's kind of a concentrated good that can benefit a business owner. Yeah. So as, as you know, you know, they have a lot of incentive to be included in any kind of minority set asides. Yeah. And p- people from Af- people representing folks from Afghanistan, people from Iran, they lobbied and tried to be included and the government said, no, for affirmative action purposes, you're white. Yeah. And, and you can see how the politics shapes all this because I mean, it's, it's, it's absurd. Um, I mean, if there's, if there's any group that's facing discrimination today, uh, I, I think Muslim Americans can make that claim. Sure. But, the, but on the, in, in the political arena, saying, you know, we should get some special help and for a politician to say, yeah, maybe we should give the nod over some, some Muslim Americans, over some, you know, white Americans, uh, it, it's going to be a tough sell. And so that is an issue. That'll be a wedge issue. It'll come eventually. I haven't seen it yet, but, um, uh, if any Republican consultants are talking or listening to this, they might see this as a wedge issue in the future, saying that party supports giving special help to Muslims. That's what that's what happened, you know, against uh, people supporting civil rights for so long. Well, that's something we can talk about going forward. I, I also want to talk to you about the implications of intermarriage for the majority minority forecast about American demographics, because I wonder if minority states, let's say Asian American, Latino, Hispanic American means the same thing a generation or two down the line when you've got uh, uh, very high rates of intermarriage, especially for the Asian population with uh, Caucasian, uh, Anglo, uh, here in the United States. Uh, Those kids, those kids' kids, do they continue to, Mm -hmm. although we might classify them as being Asian based upon some rule, continue to um, uh, have the same social meaning about their identities uh, and so on. That's, That's something I've been thinking about a lot. 
Yeah, you know, demographers have been working on this for quite a while. <clears throat> when I was in graduate school and I was working with Mary Waters um, at Harvard, she she wanted to understand statistically what is the likelihood that a child of two different races will identify with one or the other and how yeah. the gender of the father or the mother might affect that. Because yeah. you can imagine if you have a if you have a Latino last name, yeah. but your mother is Irish American, you right. might be more likely the other way if, if your name O'Malley and but right. you know because your mother was named Rodriguez, you know you might not identify as Latino. So right. there's a lot of tricky things here that are gonna that are gonna have to work them work themselves out. You got to come to California, Glenn. I'm teaching my intro to sociology class. There's 200 students in front of me. It is a rainbow coalition over here in the University of California system, and a lot of a lot of kids of mixed backgrounds. I mean, this is California. I think is is the future of the United States, and so far we're we're getting along pretty well, certainly relative to places. Uh, where we've seen a lot of the a lot of the conflicts. Well, I you know invite me and I'll come. La Jolla is not a bad <laughs> destination. Anybody out there who hasn't been to La Jolla, put it on your list. It's it's a, <laughs> not to be missed. Yeah. Uh, John, thanks so much for giving us your time here, and uh, really appreciate a chance to reconnect with you. Okay, great. Nice chatting with you, Glenn. Yeah. Take care. Take care. Bye bye.